well-regulated militia be necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I'm glad you're with us on the program today. We're going to be spending some time with Jim Wallace of the Gun Owners Action League up in Massachusetts. Jim has written a, a fantastic piece about the Second Amendment not being a second-class right, which unfortunately is not the case in Massachusetts. But what would it look like if the right to keep and bear arms actually were as sacrosanct as our freedom of speech, our ability to worship as we choose, our freedom to be secure in our persons and our property? Well, it wouldn't look like Massachusetts in 2023, that's for sure. But uh, we'll talk with Jim about that here in uh, just a second. Before we do, however, when you make choices about where you put your heart in dollars, you are supporting not only the company that made the product, but the values and the principles of that organization. It's easier to flip a switch against a company when they blatantly conflict with your values. Just look what's happened to Bud Light and Nike recently, for that matter. But do you make an effort to do business with the companies that support what you believe when you can? Well, do yourself a favor. Give Defender Ammunition Company a shot. These guys are veteran-owned and operated, and every person on their staff is military-connected. They are huge supporters of the military community, backing causes that are actually making a difference in the lives of those that served. In fact, the profits from all of their logoed gear goes directly to the charities that they back. And this company is one to support. Their ammo is top-notch. Their customer service is great. What other shipping department writes handwritten thank-you notes to their customers? Give these guys a try. They've thrown us a promo code to use at the end of the month, and that code is Bearing Arms, B E A R I N G A R M S, Bearing Arms, good for 5% off your order. Trust me, once you give these guys a try, you'll not be going anywhere else. Check them out at DefenderAmmunition.com. All right, now let's uh, turn our attention to our conversation with Mr. Jim Wallace of the Gun Owners Action League. And again, what would it look like if blue states around the country finally, belatedly, even half heartedly, started treating our right to keep and bear arms as if it were the real fundamental right that it is. Take a look and a listen. Big Jim Wallace, how you doing, sir? It's good talking with you today. Yeah, welcome back to the Second Amendment battleground states where it all started with a musket and it's going to end with an AR, I think. <laughs> That's right. The, the second class Second Amendment battleground yeah. state. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, it, it, this phrase, the Second Amendment is not a second class right. I mean, we've heard this from uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. But, uh, you know, this is something that gun owners have been saying for a long time. And here we are, Jim. What now? getting pretty darn close to a year since the Bruin decision. Yeah. Um, you know, it struck down uh, the May issue statutes. Clearly, that wasn't the end all be all. But, you know, I think it's fair to say that the Second Amendment is still being treated as a second class right, certainly in the state of Massachusetts and a lot of other blue states as well. Yeah, well, you know, we talked about this several times over the years that, you know, ever since I've been in this position, which is two, 21 years now. <laughs> um, uh, but the, I never use the term gun rights, never have. I hate that term with a passion because it's not – the guns don't have the rights. The people do. It's a civil right. It's an inalienable right. But ask somebody what that means these days. You know, they don't, right. they don't study basic civics, so forget it. Um, so it's – yeah, it's it's a brand-new concept to most of the country that the Second Amendment is actually a civil right, and they're not used to dealing with that. And that's why – Part of the reason why it set off these blue states, the five or six that just wanted to cling to their anti-Second Amendment civil rights, you know, mindset, it's a sentiment of tantrums. And I've said it before, they literally sounded like Governor Wallace of Alabama after Brown v. Board of Education. That's the way they acted. You know, if they could have, they would have stood in front of every retailer out there and blocked access. But, you know, they were probably scared to do that. But. Um, you know, so it's, it's really interesting. Now, currently we have, um, the legislature through the judiciary committee in the house is doing what they call a top down review of the gun laws. And they are holding listening sessions around the state. Matter of fact, there's one tonight way out in Greenfield, which is, uh, the pioneer Valley one step, you know, from the Berkshires, but, uh, and this one, and they have different subject matters. Uh, like this one's going to be about hunting and retailers. There was one about suicides. There was one about domestic violence. You know, so they're trying to hit all the all the keynotes. But the interesting thing is, the first conversation we had was okay. So 
if this is a top-down review, what are you willing to repeal? Or are you willing to repeal? Or is this trying to make bad lo- bad gun laws a little better to understand? Mm-hmm. Because even the attorney working for the chairman, her name is Alex, and uh, we met we met with him, and she goes, Jim, I've been trying to figure out these laws for two months. And I said, hey, we've been trying to do it for 25 years, so good <laughs> luck. <laughs> you know? And she was just like, oh, my God, I can't get through this. And I said, don't try. You're just going to hurt yourself trying. So, and, you know, most people don't probably realize outside of the state, there's a retired police chief who writes the reference book for the gun laws in Massachusetts, and it's over 400 pages long. So there's no way the average citizen could comply, period. Yeah. You know, as much as they want to, they're, they're going to violate something somewhere. Uh, so our message now has to be, and this should be across the country, whatever you do to us, you must then do to every other civil right. And last night I was talking to somebody. I said, okay, for instance, if a drunk driving conviction rises to the level of negating a civil right, then it must negate all civil rights. You can't pick and choose. And even though I can't name the case, I'm pretty sure there was a Supreme Court case about that years ago where they couldn't pick and choose which rights to restore and which rights to revoke. So that means that you would lose your right to vote. You would lose your right to free assembly, you know, all all of them, right? Because it's not a second class right. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do to us, you have to do to everybody else. And wow, does that set them off? Because they are just not used to that concept, you know? Yeah, well, and, you know, and and look, I mean, there are in um, in states like Massachusetts, you know, I I personally don't consider healthcare to be a a right. I consider that to be a service. I would like it to be affordable uh, as, you know, the wife or the spouse of somebody with a terminal illness. I uh, yeah, I'm I'm all in favor of healthcare reform, but I I have a hard time viewing things like healthcare as a right. I remember, do you remember John Edwards, the uh, former presidential candidate way back when? I remember he sat down for an interview and I think it was with, it might've been with HBO and they were just like doing like rapid fire questions. Like, is it a right? It was, you know, college. Uh, yeah, it's a right. Healthcare. Yeah, it's a right. Uh, job. Oh, absolutely. Right. Keep bare arms. Yeah. I don't know about that one. Now he, he hesitated yeah. on that one. Right. And, and yeah. but that's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. You know, if, yeah. if you believe that healthcare is a right, if you believe that universal pre-K is a right, if you believe that access to a college education is a right, I'm yep. not going to disabuse you of that in this conversation, but what happens, as you say, what happens if you then lose your right to keep in bare arms? Should you lose your access to uh, to college? Should you lose your Fourth Amendment right to be securing your person and property? Um, that's what we, we talk about. We're talking about putting the Second Amendment on a, on a level playing field with all of these other rights. And you're right, it does piss them off, Jim, because frankly, they continue to refuse to recognize that we are talking about an individual right exercised by 100 million plus Americans each and every day across this country. Well, there's a bill that's actually moving pretty fast in mass to restore voting rights to all prisoners currently in prisons or jail in Massachusetts. So what does that mean? Are you going to restore their second too? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because they're in prison. And and the reason was because they feel they're being disenfranchised just because they're in prison. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's the whole idea, being in prison, you know. But uh, the interesting thing, Cam, uh, not, not to get under the healthcare kick, but this I always find this a little fun, is when I get to speak at universities, um, this will kind of come up usually when, you know, what's a right, what's not a right. And the easy kind of phrase I use or the term I use is other than trial by jury, no civil right can depend upon the actions of others. In other words, you can't force somebody to do something for you because you think it's your civil right. And when I get kickback on that, what I tell them is, okay, if you truly believe healthcare is a civil right, we currently have nowhere near as many healthcare workers as we need. So what 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 are you studying for in college? You know, whatever. Gender studies, not anymore. You're going to be a nurse. Well, I don't want to be a nurse. Sorry. They'll sue you if you don't. And the government now has to make people be nurses because you said it's a civil right. Ooh, that changes the conversation real quick. <laughs> and then I'll get the kickback, though. Well, you can't make your own gun, actually. 
Yes, I can. And I trained as a machinist years ago, so it's even better. I can make anything I pretty much want. You just don't want me to. So, you know, my my independent civil right of the Second Amendment is self-independent, but you just won't let it happen. So, and, you know, again, another excellent point, because uh, we have the right to keep and bear arms, which means we must have the right to acquire them. Um, but, you know, again, uh, yeah. either that could be, you know, through a, a, a sale. Or it could also be through making your own gun, which now, as you point out, a lot of states are trying to make illegal. Right. Uh, right. They don't want you to make your own gun and they don't want you to be able to uh, go to a gun shop easily either. Um, and when you drive an hour and a half to your nearest gun store, they want you to wait 10 days and then drive back to go pick up your gun. Maybe maybe 20, maybe 30, maybe 60 days. Uh, you know, all sort of depends. Uh, but again, it's another aspect of, of treating this right as if it is some sort of privilege to be doled out by the uh, the powers that be. Um, yeah. I'm curious with this current, you know, listening tour taking place around the state. What's happening at the state capitol? Have have the Democrats in charge decided, all right, let's take a, a breather on passing gun legislation this year and we'll gather up all this information and then make a full push uh, in 2024? Are there stuff flying under the radar? Like, how concerned should gun owners in Massachusetts what? be right now about what's going on this session? We're being told we will probably see language by the end of August, which means okay. they would take it up either in the fall or after the first of the year because, you know, um, you know, they, they pretty much break for August, to, you know, family vacations and stuff. So, um, but it's, um, that's what we're being told. But, and, and even the chairman was on it. I mean, he's a, he's a good guy. I mean, he's in leadership. So, you know, they have to do what they do. But he was honest with us when we met with him and said, there's so many conflicting sections here that whether we get rid of them or change them or whatever, they just don't make any sense together. And I said, wow. Good. You've been paying attention. So, it, and it reminded me when I was in basic training and my drill sergeant said, you have the best equipment money can buy that are all made by different companies that don't work together. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's the gun laws. All right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the gas mass doesn't fit this and that doesn't fit that. And it's like, yeah, well, OK. So, you know, in good faith, we're trying to give them the information they need. And, uh, of course, the only thing on the listening tour is so far, all of the stops have been in gun free zone universities. So it's it's always kind of interesting when they go that. The other problem we're having, Cam, is they set up panels for these different subject matters. So they have Mm. experts. Experts. Yes. But the audience, (laughs) even after the first one, and I think today will be our third one, is who are we speaking to when we get up to talk? The panelists don't make any decisions at the state house. They're just citizens. They may work for an agency or maybe not, but who is it we're talking to? Because the chairman's usually there, and maybe a couple local legislators are sitting in the audience, but it's not like you're testifying before a committee. Mm-hmm. And so the panel, so far in the last two, will take anywhere between an hour and an hour and a half, and then, you know whether it's our side or somebody else's opinion, everybody should get a say, but then there's only maybe 40 minutes left, whatever half hour left and they get a few people and then, and then call it quits. So, you know, it's always a kind of an interesting process. It's like the hearings in the state house, you know, cause I've been doing this 25 years, but every time we have a hearing, they always announce that, the first people allowed to testify are government officials and elected officials because they have busy schedules. Meanwhile, the people who took a day off of work to go into Boston to speak for two minutes are told to wait until the government officials are done. You know, talk about just a stick in the eye, right? Well, it, it, apparently it's not just the Second Amendment that's treated as a second yeah. class, uh, <laughs> right, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, I, I was talking with our mutual friend Charlie Cook from uh, Riding Shotgun with Charlie not long ago, and he went to, it was either the first or the second, I think he's been to both of the the meetings that have been held so far, but he was telling me, like, the, the panel of experts, quote-unquote, seemed like uh, there wasn't a single uh, pro-Second Amendment voice on that panel. I mean, it was all, you know, anti-gunners. Which really does beg the question, so who is, who's supposed to be listening to whom here? Because yeah, now, the way this was uh, built made it sound like, you know, lawmakers are going to be listening to their right. constituents. But it sounds like if you go, 
you get yammered at for an hour to an hour and a half about why all these gun laws are great. And then you get a chance to speak your piece. Maybe. Now, tonight, that's going to be different. We okay. actually help them because we kind of mentioned what you just said. <laughs> and it's like, hmm. So they this one, which, which is about hunting and retailers. So we have one of the biggest retailers uh, in the state's going to be on the panel. Um, we have, as a hunter, we actually have, he's a full, well, no, he's a board member now, but he's a retired game warden in Massachusetts. And when he was a game warden, he was kind of their gun law expert. Uh, so that'll be good. So, and then the next one is supposed to be May 7th in Lowell. Uh, and that one's going to be about ghost guns. So that should be fun. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, Hey, I, listen, I'm glad to know that they actually are listening and that, uh, this is going to be a little bit uh, different of a format. Um, yeah. will you come back on after the, uh, the ghost gun, uh, oh, yeah. uh, uh, stop. So we can talk about that. Yeah, if I'll, I'll see if my trick or treat bag's full. You know, after the event, uh, boy, wouldn't that be funny if we handed out Halloween candy at that one? <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Jim Wallace of the uh, Gun Owners Action. Hey, listen, man, what is your message for Massachusetts gun owners right now? Um, you know, living in this sort of uh, reality where the right to keep our arms is being treated as a second class right. Um, what should they be doing? What do they? You know, what are what are gun owners doing? What are gun owner action league members doing right now? Here's the big message, especially this year after Bruin. No civil rights battle has ever been successfully won by sitting home and complaining. You cannot do this from behind your keyboard at night on social media and just complain. You have to get out and be visible, to be vocal, to, to make them see that, listen, there's five, 600,000 of us in this state. We are not just some obscure piece of population that you can ignore. And traditionally, gun owners don't do that. It's a struggle to get them out, you know. Um, and I will tell you firsthand, I, I've called some of our people out because last year we had a lobby day at the state house, and 25 people showed up. The moms knew about what we were doing. They showed up with 100. So, you know, we got 18,000 members and 25 people show up. I know it's hard. I know you got to work for a living, sometimes two jobs, family, whatever. Listen, this is your civil rights. This is in historic time in our lives for the Second Amendment. You can't do this sitting at home. You got to get out there. You got to be vocal. You got to be seen. Bottom line. Absolutely. Well, Jim Wallace, listen, man, I appreciate you using your voice uh, and uh, dedicating your time in defense of our right to keep and bear arms. Uh, I am looking forward to having you back on the show again very soon. And thank you so much for coming on the show today. Absolutely. Well, I have to use my voice because I got a face for radio. So. <laughs> you and me both, big guy. <laughs> Jim Wallace, I will uh, talk to you again very soon. But thanks for joining us here on Cam and Company. All right. Thanks, Cam. I appreciate Jim being with us. And uh, I'm looking forward to having him back on after that uh, ghost gun hearing here in a couple of days. Right now, let's turn our attention to today's Armed Citizen story, our uh, good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. Actually, before we do that, here's something we have to really think about. What is happening with the banks? This is literally crazy. Can you imagine what this is going to do to the retirement savings of America? Now, I want to tell you what I heard from Augusta Precious Metals. Gold buying is on fire right now because people want gold IRAs to protect their retirement savings. And get this, if you have 100000 plus saved for retirement, Augusta will pay you in pure gold to learn how gold IRAs can protect you. That is a big deal. A pure gold coin for free. Reach out to Augusta Precious Metals today and learn how you can get started with gold. Don't let bank failures get you down. Get this free gold and get some peace of mind. Just call 855-222-4997 to learn whether gold can help protect your retirement and get your free gold coin. That's Augusta Precious Metals at 855-222-4997. Again, 855-222-4997. 4997. All right, now let's turn our attention to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. We'll start there with a, a story out of WUSA uh, in Washington, D.C., talking about a neighborhood living in fear of a sex offender who has been repeatedly released from jail after arrest. As they note, sex crimes charged as misdemeanors often prevent judges from detaining offenders, leading to more victims. This is something that, uh, you know, D.C. officials are well aware of, and yet they have done nothing to change the untenable status quo. So you've got this uh, guy who's been arrested, again, multiple times over the past couple of years. Uh, most recently, back on April 13th, uh, 54-year-old Derek Jones 
back in handcuffs after the Metropolitan Police accused him of sexually abusing a five-year-old girl by allegedly exposing himself and uh, fondling himself in front of her in the Mount Pleasant neighborhood. Judy Clayton is uh, one of Jones' neighbors and is a part of a group of neighbors that's been reporting on Jones for about three and a half years. D.C. police first arrested Jones for exposure in 2018, in this case, fondling himself in front of four kids at a D.C. public library. Now, under D.C.'s criminal code, uh, lewd, indecent, or obscene acts is a misdemeanor. Period. There, there's no felony version of that. If you're whipping it out and exposing yourself in front of kids at a public library, that's always going to be classified as a misdemeanor. Uh, and that was the case for Jones. D.C. criminal code also prohibits judges from detaining defendants on misdemeanor charges. So, Jones was released after he was arrested. And then he didn't show up for his court date. In 2021, Jones was arrested again, this time for exposing himself and committing lewd acts on the Metro at the Columbia Heights station. A a judge found Jones guilty, according to WSA, but suspended his 30-day prison sentence and put him on supervised probation instead. Yeah. Jones went back to his Mount Pleasant neighborhood. Neighbors told WUSA that he continued to repeatedly expose himself while committing lewd acts. It was so brazen they were actually able to capture it on camera. He was uh, even filmed exposing himself right by an elementary school. Uh, The elementary school principal even called police. Uh, But it was not again until a couple of weeks ago that, uh, well, I take that back. In 2022, Jones was arrested again on a misdemeanor charge of committing lewd and decent or obscene acts. This time at a bus stop in the Mount Pleasant neighborhood with uh, children witnessing him fondling himself. Once again, misdemeanor charges. Since he was on probation at the time, a judge gave him the maximum sentence allowed by law, 90 days in jail. That's it, 90 days. And then he was free to go until he was arrested again a couple weeks ago, once again charged with misdemeanors. Now, Jones's defense attorney, uh, Raymond Jones, says that it's not the length of the sentence of the problem. He says, what services are we providing? The recidivism. How are we stopping people from coming back to jail again? And we can say, well, let's lock them up. That's the key. But the person has to get out. We can't lock up a misdemeanor person for 25 years, right? No. I mean, you could classify repeat offenses as a felony. You could do that, which is a step that Washington, D.C. hasn't taken. Um, But Jones does have a point. The system isn't working here. Criminal justice system is spitting this guy right back onto the street no matter how many times he commits these offenses. And where are the mental health services? Where is the involuntary commitment if Mr. Jones can't keep diddling himself in front of school kids? If the criminal statutes don't provide for him to be removed from society until he quits diddling himself in front of school kids, what about the mental health laws in Washington, D.C.? can't tell me that uh, Mr. Jones is entirely in his right mind if he is repeatedly whipping it out and exposing himself to school children. Now, again, I happen to think that would rise to a felony level offense at some point, but uh, powers that be in Washington, D.C. clearly disagree. Nor are they interested in improving their mental health access so that individuals who are troubled uh, can get the help that they need and perhaps even the confinement that they need in order to protect the broader public at large. Nope. Instead, they're too busy uh, trying to criminalize the right to keep and bear arms, going after legal gun owners, doing everything that they can to cut down on the right of self-defense, while uh, repeat offenders like Mr. Jones get a slap on the wrist or a spank on the monkey, I suppose, and uh, are sent on their merry way. Today's Armed Citizen story from San Francisco, of all places, where prosecutors have said that a uh, security guard who shot and killed a man at a Walgreens, was acting in self-defense and will not face murder charges. This after the uh, security guard was arrested. Um, But now Michael Rowan Anthony has been released from jail, a free man, and will not be facing any charges in connection with that shooting. According to uh, prosecutors who released a statement, the evidence clearly shows that the suspect believed the suspect I think we call him a victim now since they've decided not to charge him, but uh, they call him a suspect. The suspect believed that he was in mortal danger and acted in self-defense. Same went on to say, we cannot bring forward charges when there is credible evidence of reasonable self-defense. Doing so would be unethical and create false hope for a successful prosecution. Now, the same day that uh, Anthony was released from jail, supporters of the man who was shot and killed, uh, 24-year-old Banco Brown, 
held a, a rally in San Francisco to demand justice for his death. Jessica Nolan, a representative from the Young Women's Freedom Center, said, quote, it's insane that Walgreens has armed security. There's nothing in that store worth a human life. Except, of course, for the human lives inside that store. Right? I, 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 listen, I will agree with Jessica Nolan that uh, you know, providing armed security to stop someone from shoplifting a hot pocket may be a little extreme. However, uh, there is genuine concern in San Francisco and a lot of other cities that uh, shoplifters can become violent themselves. Uh, and so, yeah, there is a need to protect and defend not only the uh, employees of the store, but perhaps the customers as well. Uh, and in this case, again, according to prosecutors, the security guard was acting within the law and was acting in defense of his life, or perhaps the lives of others, when he shot and killed Brown. We'll uh, see if we can find more details on this case and uh, bring them to you. Uh, but today's uh, good deed of the day, we got plenty of information about that. Memphis, Tennessee, right place, right time for some Memphis light uh, and gas water workers who helped save a truck driver's life. This apparently was uh, last month at some point. Truck driver had uh, gone onto a drive uh, job site and uh, asked the uh, seven-person crew if he could get around the construction zone because the road was blocked. Um, David Hinchy, who is the uh, uh, crew leader, saw something unusual. He said, I noticed the driver easing forward. He said he's right into one of our poles. So I ran around the truck and I jumped up on the side. He was slumped towards the middle of the seat and I could see that he was struggling to breathe. Hinchy then yelled for a lineman to help the driver. He called the dispatcher for an ambulance. The uh, crewman who helped told Hinchy that he believed the uh, truck driver didn't have a pulse. So the crewman performed CPR on this truck driver for 17 minutes until emergency crews arrived. Again, 17 minutes for a call about somebody not breathing. Uh, it's not just the police who are, you know, minutes away when seconds count. And that's no fault of police, no fault of the EMS workers. I'm sure they got there as fast as they could. But, you know, staffing problems for first responders, a huge issue right now. And even if you have a emergency, that doesn't mean that emergency crews are going to be able to get to you quickly. Thankfully, in this case, the linemen knew CPR, were able to respond. They performed CPR uh, and, again, assisted this gentleman breathing for 17 minutes until paramedics arrived. He just said uh, paramedics told us if it weren't for what we had done for him, the driver probably wouldn't be here. It all boils down to training from working at uh, MLGW. We're trained on how to react in an emergency like this. So in addition to Hinchy, uh, Shadburn Old III, Daniel Reed, Thomas Malone, Cade Shackelford, Justin McCarter, and uh, Zachary Doty all in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing to save the life of another. And we thank you for your very, very good deed. Now, that is all the time we've got for you in this edition of Barry and Arms, Cam and Company. I want to thank you, as always, for being a part of the program. And I'm looking forward to being back with you tomorrow for a Hump Day Wednesday edition. Uh, do check out BarryandArms.com throughout the day that we've got you covered on all of the major segment news and issues of the day, including uh, an appeal to the Supreme Court to weigh in on a gun ban in Illinois. Not the uh, statewide ban, but a gun ban case. More armed citizen stories, the latest legislative updates, good and bad from across the nation. It's all waiting for you there at BarronArms.com. And if you like what you see, I'd encourage you to become a VIP member. Not only will you get the warm, fuzzy feeling of knowing that you are supporting the independent pro Second Amendment journalism that we're doing at Barron Arms, but we're going to give you exclusive content. News stories and analysis you won't find anywhere else because your support really does matter. And it truly makes a difference. So thank you again. Just go to BarryandArms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNRIGHTS. You get a significant savings on your VIP membership. And again, thank you for your support. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free.